Well, hello, and uh, we're going to continue on with our online A to Z in dental implant ther therapy with our session two. In the first session, we reviewed um, the biologic basis to our belief of using implants and also the key component to having successful restorative, and that is basically having a master model that's accurate. To be successful in a general terms, though, we need treatment planning. We need to understand the different areas that we work at in the mouth and to incorporate the issues imperative with each area so we get the best possible results. The next area that we're going to talk about, our session two, is posterior implant restorative issues. In this area, we're not as concerned about aesthetics. We are concerned about function, force. We're concerned about the bruxing patient. We're concerned about the patient that puts a lot of load. We have anatomic, anatomical issues like the mandibular canal, the mental foramen, sinuses, the quality of bone. All those issues come into play in the posterior components. So we need to talk about those and evaluate our best uh, techniques to maximize the success rates. The first thing I'd like to say is that a successful outcome depends on careful and thorough treatment planning, usually by the restorative dentist. We need to be able to tell the surgeon where we need the implants to be to achieve the result of that individual patient. Placing the implants surgically where the bone is and then hoping we can achieve a successful result is something we hopefully stopped doing 10 years ago. This is not the way we should proceed with implant dentistry. The first key to successful restorative implant dentistry is determining the desired restoration for the patient evaluating the patient to de determine the aesthetic needs, the functional needs, and then to create the implant placement within that range of acceptability. When we look at it that way, first restoration, then implant placement on, based on biologic principles, we can be predictable and achieve a high degree of success. In order to get the patient on our side, we need to understand their position. We need to ask open-ended questions. Why is the patient there? In their own words, what happened to them? Why do they need a restoration? It might be something that you think is silly because the patient's been coming to you, you've both existed through this, but the patient's perception of why they ended up in this uh, position may be very different than yours. To the patient, they may remember that they needed a crown. They may have forgotten that the, the root was fractured and you tried doing a crown, but they, they remember they needed a crown, and then they needed a, a root canal, and then they needed the root canal retreated, and then they needed an apico, and then they needed the tooth extracted. And then you look at the situation, and your first thought is, well, this posterior tooth could well do with a crown, and the anterior tooth, maybe it needs a crown as well, so a three-unit bridge is very valid, and that still is a good restoration for the patient. But to the patient, they realize that they lost a tooth because it needed a crown. And now you want to do more crowns, and all they can think of is they're going to lose more teeth. Another way, quite often, to look at this is that there isn't a patient alive that's excited about the fact that you get to drill on their teeth. We're used to doing it. It's our bread and butter. We do it every day. But that's not necessarily why the patient is sitting in our chairs. Objectively, though, we need to go beyond why the patient wants a certain treatment or what their key trigger issues might be. We need to objectively understand what is going on with this individual patient so we can make good determination for the final result. We need to do a thorough clinical exam. We need to examine the entire patient, not the single missing tooth. What's the nature of the entire occlusion? Do they have guidance? Are they a bruxer? Are we fracturing teeth throughout the mouth? Do we have occlusion on the opposite arch? Do we have extruded teeth? We need to make all those evaluations. We need to do a good, thorough radiographic examination. A full mouth series is a quite good beginning. If you have access to a panoramic film, a, a great adjunct to that. Going beyond that for the actual placement often requires more advanced uh, radiographic techniques like a CAD CAM uh, type technique uh, or a, a computer uh, type uh, x-ray. We as restorative dentists need to do study models. We need to start to focus the patient in terms of their aesthetic concerns, their functional needs. Why is the patient in the chair? How will they chew? What is their uh, basic diet? How do they use their mouths? All those may be uh, important considerations to our final restoration. I like to think of every patient in terms of these terms. The first thing I ask myself, are they missing only teeth or soft tissue, bone, and teeth? 
we all know as dentists that you extract a tooth, you immediately lose some degree of bone and some degree of soft tissue. So every patient has some degree of that. But quite often the patient doesn't realize it. They think, ah, I've just lost teeth, I want them back. You look at the case and realize, well, there's a significant amount of bone loss. The teeth might be quite a bit longer than ideal. So we need to talk to the patient about, is it an aesthetic or a non-aesthetic reconstruction required? There are times that, and we'll get into this more in a, in a future session, but when is a removable restoration actually better than a fixed restoration? That might surprise you. But if we have significant bone and soft tissue loss, a huge defect, doing a fixed result may not be to the patient's advantage as much as a removable result, which could have a significant acrylic flange to obturate this big defect. We also try to get a feel for the load potential. I want you to expect that any bruxing patient will destroy whatever you put in the mouth, regardless if it's a conventional dentistry, a removable dentistry, or implant dentistry, the patient will eventually destroy it. We need to treatment plan these patients differently and maybe just educate the patient differently about their potential to destroy what you put in their mouth. We also might try to evaluate the potential for immediate placement and or immediate restoration and or immediate function. Is this of advantage to the patient, the case, to the clinical outcome of the case? Is there times that doing that treatment is more conservative, saves bone, saves top tissue? We need to evaluate all those possibilities really before we go on. In our oral exam, maybe the patients came to us just because they're missing one tooth. So do we focus on that one area or do we, we look at the entire mouth? I feel it's imperative that we look at the entire mouth and get a feel for what's going on. Decay, uh, periodontal disease, gingivitis, missing teeth, all those factors come into play. When we look at a case like this and we start to think of treatment planning options, we can evaluate the case on many levels and decide, well, it could be removable, it could be fixed. Can we do it purely as conventional fixed or do we need to use implants? Maybe on a case like this, the key missing tooth might be uh, the canine. Without the canine, can we do fixed bridges? Do we have to do implants? Maybe we don't have good bone in the uh, posterior molar area, but we can do a three-unit bridge in there, that area. We have to restore the, the natural teeth seven and nine. Maybe that case is better off with a three-unit bridge. I'm not saying it is, but it might be due to the bone level, uh, the patient's willingness to go through a bone reconstruction or a soft tissue reconstruction. And then leaving a key area, the missing premolar and the canine, on this case would be best served with a, a couple implants. So we can start to evaluate that just by looking at the patient. When we're looking at a posterior segment, I think the number one thing to look at is the, the diameter or the width of the ridge.